was involved with the church and other things. So, important people. Um, today, we have J.D. Bates with us. So. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for, for inviting me. Uh, this is quite a place that you have here, this, this museum. Uh, as I said, my name is John Peter Baden, and uh, I think it can probably be said without fear of contradiction that many people who have graduated from the St. John's College and are now serving the church and the country in all parts of the world, that many of you perhaps know very little about me. So here's my chance to tell a little bit about my life story. You know, some people have called me a businessman who was, who's like a juggler, who could keep five balls in the air at any one time. I had five businesses and all of them in Winfield here were a huge success. But, but enough about that. Let's, let's start from the beginning. I was born March the 24th, 1851 in Hanover, Germany. I was the youngest of five children, and I went by JP most of my life. My mother died when I was just two days old, so I really never got to know her very well. My father, on the other hand, was a farmer of moderate circumstances, and so I had to pitch in and help, and at the age of seven years, I had to herd sheep. Incidentally, in my life, there, there was a, a story that really kind of shaped my life. A lamb took sick, and I nursed that lamb back to health. I was, I was so taken with the fact that the lamb was so helpless that I prayed to God for its recovery. And you know what? It did recover. This showed in my early life that I had a strong and a true faith, and as a result, my favorite psalm became Psalm 23, and I'm sure you all know what that is. The Lord is my shepherd. Well, after I was confirmed in Germany, I set sail for New York City, and I arrived on May the 23rd, 1866, with my older brothers, Henry and John. And at the age of 15, I found my way to a town in Missouri called Hannibal, where my oldest brother, Dietrich, had worked there as a cigar manufacturer. And by the way, my brother Dietrich came to the United States a little earlier, 1857. So I also went to work at this cigar factory. And after about a year's time frame, I had mastered the art of making cigars. And I was earning the, the sum of $125 a month. Wow. And you see, I was energetic, but you know what? I was a saving young man. And when not working, I attended public school and concentrated on learning English. And after that, I moved to St. Louis and I entered Jones Commercial College. I received my diploma from this institution in 1870 at the age of 19. In the meantime, my brothers, Henry and John, had moved to Independence, Kansas, where they opened up a grocery store. And after graduating from Jones Commercial College, well, I followed them to Kansas, and a short time later began my first business venture in a little town nearby called Columbus, Kansas. It was a confectionery store. And well, it kind of had a pool hall along with it. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't pan out very well, so I moved back to Independence to work with my brothers. And I began as a clerk, and I worked very diligently during the daytime. But after hours, I bought and sold wild game. 
And this continued for seven years that I was in independence. It was during this period that I saved the sum of $5,000. And this was quite a sum of money for a young man in 1877. In that year, while still in independence, I met and courted a beautiful young lady by the name of Adelaide Elizabeth Balin. Most of our courtship was carried on by letter since she lived with her family in Neosho, Missouri. And on January the 15th, 1878, we were married. And our marriage was blessed with two sons, Martin and Ernst. It was in the late spring of 1879 that we left Independence and came to Winfield, then a city of about 2,500 inhabitants. With $5,000 that I had, I had saved I, and nurtured, I carefully, uh, uh, during the seven years, I bought a rundown mercantile establishment. Now, now, there was a great deal of activity here in Winfield and Collie County in April of 1879. The Santa Fe Railroad was coming to Winfield, and at the same time, our Kansas City, well, I guess I should say Ar Arkansas City, had a population of about 800, and Sedgwick County, including Wichita, was smaller in population than Collie County. On August the 7th, 1879, I traveled east to buy new stock. And since the railroad was not quite complete, I had to travel by stagecoach. I returned from my eastern trip with piles and piles of new goods, which filled the large storage room I had to overflowing. Now, all I needed was plenty of customers. My idea of going directly to the wholesaler and not depending on a drummer to come by was motivated by the fact that, that I wanted to know my suppliers personally and that they know me as well. In this way, I could establish credit with the wholesale houses. You see, you see, credit was done on a more personal and formal basis at that point in time. I wanted to demonstrate to the wholesalers the kind of a person that I was. My business venture in Winton Winfield was quite successful. Merchandise came into the store every day, and it moved out almost as fast as it came in. My idea of merchandising was small profits and big volume. But I must tell you that I was a strong believer in advertising as well, as I ran ads continuously in the Winfield Courier. Additionally, I was a strong believer and placed a great deal of emphasis on the name Baden. For when I advertised, I would put in bold black letters across the top of the page to emphasize, and in a sale below, I would again sign J.P. Baden. I was a great believer in the value of a name. Well, I continued what I had started in Independence with the buying and selling of wild game and poultry. This was a pretty good business, and I even went so far as to buy guns and shells for the young man of Winfield who would go out and shoot prairie chickens. They literally brought in wagon loads of prairie chickens, and then I would pay them for the game, well, less the cost of shells. <laughs> Carloads of poultry and wild game were sent from Winfield to Chicago and, New and the New York markets. In the early 1890s, I had a vision to build a college and the courage to provide the initial $1,200 for one block of land. I also provided $50,000 for the construction of its first building. Construction began in 1893, and Baden Hall, as it became known, was completed in, in 1894. Now, my wife Adelaide named the institution St. John's College after John the Evangelist, 
the beloved disciple and the Savior and the apostle of love which embraces all and shuts out none. It was my dedication that sustained the college through, the, through its early years of history. Now I have to tell you, a friend of mine by the name of uh, Tom Richardson had a conversation about St. John's. And I told him this, I told him that, that Texas eggs deserve much of the credit for the building of the college. Three years earlier, I had bought three carloads of Texas eggs. Those eggs paid me a profit of $1,000 per car. And I thought I was making money way too fast, and I resolved to give my home, my city, and my church the building of what became known as Baton Hall on the new campus of St. John's College. Now, when Tom asked me for an explanation, I told him, well, the Texas hands agreed with me that the profits were too large, and they laid rotten eggs ever since. <laughs> <laughs> now, my next big economic development was the building of a huge cold storage plant together with an ice plant. They were really two businesses that worked quite well together. The packing house was one business and it received its whole complement of refrigeration from the ice plant. Now, my friend Tom Richardson, who I mentioned earlier, said, he was a reporter now for the Galveston, Texas News. He met me on August the 13th in 1896 for an interview. And in his article, he described me as the most interesting character in Kansas commercial circles. In that article, he went on to say that during the last three years of hard times, which then were known as the Cleveland Depression, I had done a business aggregating of almost two million dollars in a city whose population at that time just exceeded 5,000 people. I guess I was so busy that I didn't realize that this was the situation. <coughs> I was so involved personally with my business, but I did uh, uh, entrust a great deal of a daily supervision of the business to very trustworthy foreman. People told me that I had a keen eye for understanding people and that I could almost look through people to see what was in them. I guess I was quick to spot any hidden talent in men. Well, the packing house was, a com was completed and it was a huge building. It was about 254 feet by 80 feet. And I don't know, compare that to this room, it would be much larger than this room. And it had a cold storage capacity of about 22 railroad cars. <laughs> the ice house had a capacity of about 12,000 tons, or 24 million pounds per year. One of my first customers of the ice house was the Frisco Railroad. It bought a whole train load of ice for its first consignment. And eventually, these two buildings were expanded from around 20,000 square feet to over 60,000 square feet. And I employed anywhere from 60 to 100 men in these two operations. And by March of 1892, four carloads of eggs were being shipped every week from the packing house. Four carloads, well, that meant 48,000 dozen eggs. <laughs> and this represented $10,000 a week. That meant I sold eggs for, well, let's see, that would be about 20 cents a dozen. <laughs> the butter capacity of the packing house was about 14,000 pounds a day. During the summer months, better than 10,000 pounds of butter was shipped from these two facilities. And in addition, an average of one car of produce a day or a yearly shipment over, of over 300 cars from the packing house alone. And to give you some idea of the size of this operation, the produce output in 1896 reached the enormous figure of over 
840,000 pounds of butter, over 57,000 cases or 1,727,000 dozens of eggs, and over 592,000 pounds of poultry. As you can see, the business was constantly growing. Uh, let me tell you about the receipts for the first three months of the next year, 1897. For eggs alone, it amounted to 37,000 cases. And payroll. Payroll for these first three months amounted to almost $2,500 per month, while the money I paid to suppliers for the products amounted to $74,000 per month. You know, one might ask how I succeeded in assembling such a, a large volume of produce for these plants. Well, well, let me tell you that I paid Chicago prices for all produce, and I paid cash for that produce. The fact alone attracted many sellers from outside of the Winfield trade area. And there was, this was coupled with the fact that I had good buyers and sellers on the road for my enterprises. And then I worked very closely with the railroads, and I must say the railroads, well, they seemed to favor me. I made special arrangements with these three railroads in Winfield to haul milk and produce into the city. And in addition, there was also six rural routes served by teams and wagons to gather the produce and the milk from the nearby area. <coughs> then there were people who lived close to Winfield who brought their products. Well, they brought them right directly to the plant. And I must tell you that many of my nearby customers traded their produce for groceries and clothing at my mercantile. And if they, it, but if they desired it, they could take out cash, whatever they had coming to them. Well, it was obvious to me that the mercantile store was greatly helped by the produce business. Well, turkeys and ducks and chickens by the thousands came by wagons. By express and crates and often by carloads from Oklahoma and other distant locations. One might ask what I did with the produce. Well, I must confess that I always knew where to ship it before it actually came into Winfield. Much of it was shipped to Chicago and New York, where I had direct business connections with the commission houses, and they took all that I could send. Well, and then too, there was Texas. I had a big trade there, and there were too many cities of any size in Texas, which, which I did not have a customer. As a matter of fact, there was one Texas customer to whom I sold 100,000 pounds of butter in 30 days. Jeez. That's a lot of butter, isn't it? <laughs> well, in Kansas and Oklahoma Territory, the Baden name became a household word. And besides selling in the United States, I even developed markets in England to which we shipped one carload of produce each week. One week it was sent to Manchester, and the next week it was sent to Liverpool. So much for the produce and the ice business. The single biggest industry which I owned was a flour mill, <coughs> which I bought in 1889. Well, it was in a rundown condition, but it had the capacity of producing almost 600 barrels of flour a day. The previous owner had failed in business, well, I was kind of sure that I could make it profitable, so I offered to buy the mill for 50 cents on the dollar. Now, the first thing I did was to remodel the mill's entire operation, to install new machinery, increasing the capacity to 1,200 barrels a day. And I have to say that all of my business ventures, this one was probably my favorite. The mill covered almost 10 acres and employed 150 men on an annual basis. The annual payroll for wages was $165,000, and in 
and the yearly output of the plant was about two million dollars. We shipped no less than a carload of flour a day from the mill to say nothing about the amount sold in and around Winfield and, and Kansas in general. Our customers could be found throughout Oklahoma and Texas as well. And many have wondered why I was so, while I was financially so successful. And what were the business methods that I used? Some have called me a keen, shrewd man. My fellow businessmen in Winf Winfield often describe me as a human dynamo. Well, let me tell you that I took many calculated risks, but I calculated the risks very carefully before I took them. I'm sure people who did not know the methods of business in the world at that time thought, well, that guy is a senseless gambler. Now, now, my banker was W.C. Robinson of the First National Bank. And I know he had strong misgivings when one day I stepped into the bank and I asked him for a loan of $20,000 to buy wheat. Now, in today's market, that would be asking to borrow about between seven and $800,000. Remember, Remember now, this was the Cleveland Depression. But, but Mr. Robinson finally agreed to make me the loan. And with confidence, which people had, like Mr. Robinson in me, and the shrewd judgment, the fact that I never failed to give 100 cents on the dollar were perhaps the greatest asset that I had in my business operations. You know, in, in, in managing my enterprises, I placed an intelligent and responsible person at the head. But I always, always made the final decision on matters of major concern. I was always working on business. And I remembered what my friend Tom Richardson said about me when he was interviewing me for a story in the Galveston News. Here's what he wrote, and I quote, Mr. Baden was simultaneously answering my questions and conducting the affairs of business. During our talk, Mr. Baden was repeatedly disturbed. He received telegraphic reports from the Chicago grain markets, shook his head and said, no one can figure out a day ahead under existing circumstances. He sold a car of ice, bought a car of wheat, sold a car of flour, and gave a grain dealer in nearby village in Chicago quotations. He entertained a coal drummer, bought a load of hay, sold a car load of, uh, of poultry to a house in New York, and the telephone was the means of communication for most of these transactions. You see, you see when the, when the telephone services were made available in Winfield, and that was about 1880s, I think I was among the first to subscribe to this new service. Well, in 1890, the Winfield Courier listed the names of the residents owning the 50 telephones that were used in Winfield. <laughs> My name was listed as the only person having two. <laughs> you know, earlier we talked about taking risks. Let me tell you about one of them. Once I shipped a carload of produce to Chicago at the bottom of the Cleveland Depression. When no one would buy it in Chicago, I immediately telegraphed the railroad company to route the car to New York, even though I had no contact with any New York firm for shipment. Through some of my New York contacts, I sold the produce sold it at a profit of a thousand dollars more than what I expected to make in Chicago. Uh, let me tell you, I was no stretch of the imagination a miser. I did not carry on business merely to accumulate wealth. As a matter of fact, I never had much money readily available. Most of my business was largely done with borrowed capital. 
I did not believe in saving money just so a person could say that he had it. But I did believe strongly that money could be used to bring blessings to mankind. And the way I looked on money, and especially on credit, was that these were instruments for doing things. Well, in 1899, there was this young clerk, uh, Mr. Martin Jarvis of the First National Bank. And it was his job to meet me each morning to go over my business plan for the day. If I had an overdraft at the bank, well, which I often did, Mr. Jarvis was instructed to accept my note to cover the amount. And if I had a balance, well, he was to inform me of the amount so that business could go on without delay. I think I had virtually unlimited credit with the First National Bank. Remember that loan that I mentioned earlier of about $20,000? Well, let me tell you what happened. I bought the wheat, and by the time I had it ground into flour, the price of wheat had gone up. And well, you guessed it, I made a handsome profit. They tell me you can't do business like this anymore because, well, I guess the banking laws just won't allow it. You know, in, in my business, I believed using modern methods wherever we could. For example, in the packing house, I was one of the first to candle eggs by passing each egg over a light. This way, my help could separate the eggs into six different grades, and before an egg went into its case, it was examined as thoroughly as though that egg was worth the dollar. This was all done before it became a law that you had to do that. I wanted the Baden name and reputation to stand for quality, so it had to be protected. I was also interested in making my business more efficient and more profitable. For example, let me tell you of one of the methods of loading and unloading produce. As I mentioned earlier, I was instrumental in getting three railroads to come into Winfield, the Santa Fe, the Frisco, and the Missouri Pacific. And each had lines into town and had spurs that were running directly to my businesses. My produce plant was so arranged that workers could load or unload four cars at the same time rather than just one. And incidentally, I must tell you that my business paid the express company and the railroads. They paid them more in revenue than the total receipts amounted to from the whole town of Winfield. Now, now one might ask why I worked so incessantly at the efficiency and profitability of my business. I didn't want to do it merely to make money because I saw no use in money merely to say that, well, I had it. Rather, rather, I wanted to leave Winfield a much better town than when I came to it. And so I have to tell you that every cultural advancement of those days, well, they found me very attentive. I was one of the original, uh, originator of the, and chairman of the Chautauqua Society. You see the banner over here. This outstanding organization provided both entertainment and education to the people of Winfield. The society brought to Winfield such renowned and outstanding speakers such as William Jennings Bryan. And another of my favorite organizations was the Winfield Hospital Board. As a matter of fact, I was the first chairman of the hospital board which was appointed in 1899. A good friend of mine, Mr. P.A. Albright, was also a member. I remember reading in the newspaper following the morning after we were, both of us were appointed, there was a line in the Winfield Courier that most encouragingly read as follows. Now, the future of the hospital is insured. When businessmen like Baden and Albright take a hold of things, they move. That was quite a compliment for the two of us. 
Well, within two weeks of our appointment, the members had, had pushed the project to a point where they had, had bought a site and on uh, 9th Avenue in College, where the famous hospital was soon constructed. You know, in my time, there were about four or five men in Winfield who were of like mind. These men were always willing to give up their earthly possessions for the growth and the enhancement of the Winfield community. I guess you can say that we made up an elite segment of the population that helped to promote every good cause for whenever we took a hold of anything, I'm telling you, it flourished. But my interests always fluctuated between my home, my business, my church, and the city of Winfield. I was always concerned for my community, and I dedicated myself to civic progress. Now let me tell you a little about my health. I did have several attacks of illness, and that was probably because I drove my body very hard. And it's perhaps surprising that this old body didn't give out a whole lot earlier. In 1897, I went to Battle Creek, Michigan to get relief from a kidney ailment. I was then about 46 years old. And this was the first evidence of any real serious illness. I spent about three weeks in Battle Creek, and I seem to have gotten some relief from this ailment. And during the last week of February in 1900, I contracted pneumonia. And, it was, and this time, it was a severe attack. The newspaper in Winfield carried a report of the illness on March 1st saying that I had not rested well at all on Friday night. And on Saturday, however, the report in the Courier was, it was a little more encouraging. But not for long. That Saturday evening at 9.45, the restless person known as John Peter Baden was at peace. The good Lord had called him home. The article in the Winfield Courier reported my death, carrying the following headline, City in Mourning. The news article reflected the shock that the entire community experienced. My funeral was held five days later as a city-wide observance. All the businesses were closed, the courthouse was shut down, including district court, and all the public school classes were dismissed. I was laid to rest at the age of 49 years and two days. Articles in the newspaper spoke of me as a God-fearing man who believed that life itself was given to us that we might serve our fellow man. They said I was loyal to my church and that I regarded myself as a steward of all the gifts that God had entrusted to me. And finally it was reported that I was the man who was before the beginning, the man without humanly speaking, there would have been no St. John's College. That's the story of John Peter Baden. <laughs> Now, now let me tell you how this all came about. I take care of the St. John's College Alumni Association and I was paging through some of the old uh, Johnny Reporters, it's called. And I found that one of the presidents, uh, President Mundinger, of the college had written this piece, only he wrote it as a biography of John Peter Baden. I took that piece and I rewrote it in first person so that I was playing John Peter Baden. Every June, the St. John's College Alumni Association has a reunion and we draw it's hard to tell. Anywhere from 80 to, we've had as high as 
220, 30 people, alumni, back for a reunion in June. And in 2013, this is about the time frame that I had found this article, I said to Julie Utt, and I think many of you perhaps know Julie, I said, Julie, I said, how would you like to play my wife Adelaide? She said, sure. <laughs> so, for that reunion in 2013, I got a hold of Julia Lambert from the Winfield Community Theater, and I said, Julia, and I showed her that picture. And I said, Julia, can you make me look like that? <laughs> and she says, you bet. <laughs> so, Julia and I went up to the dressing room at Meyer Hall. We got made up, and we came walking over to the community center. And I walked up to the podium, and I said, hey, I said, I understand you're having a reunion here. I said, well, listen, my name is John Peter Baden, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about my life story. So Julie and I went, went through, and, and I had taken uh, information and rewrote a piece for Julie as, because Adelaide was really a philanthropist in her own right. I mean, she lived up until 1942, I think it was. And, and uh, so uh, we did that, and, and uh, we got ch changed, came back down to the community center, and washed my hair, and you know, took off the mustache and everything else, and, and I was over by the registration table, and this elderly lady came over to me, and she said to me, she said, did you see John Peter Baden? <laughs> and I said, really? She said, yeah. She said, boy, he was really, he told us his whole life story. You know, he was quite a businessman in Winfield. And I said, really? She said, boy, it was really, did you see it? And I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, I did. <laughs> I paused a little bit and I said, ma'am, that was me. She said, oh no, it couldn't have been. <laughs> anyway, so that's how this all came about. I, I, I wanted really to have Julia, uh, Juliet with me today to play the part of, of Adelaide because she has quite a story uh, in her own right. And, uh, but Julie said, no, she said, I'm, I'm I don't want to at this point in time, and I understood. So, anyway, that is the story, yes. A lot of the things I've read about John Peter Bain is what a good employer you were, that your employees, a lot of them relied on you that when they got sick or when they had hospital bills, you paid them, and you continued their salaries until they could come back to work. Yeah, yeah. And you helped them find housing and... He was a very, very generous man. But a shrewd businessman too. I mean, you can see by some of the things that he that he uh, did, his businesses. Uh, he made money. I mean, he he was part of that Winfield business community that made Winfield what it is today. You know, he and Albright and and a couple of other guys. You know, when it's like the, what the Courier said, if they took a hold of it. I drove that was going to happen in Winfield. So, yeah, he was a, you know, I guess I marvel at the fact that he was just 49 years old. And I wonder if he had lived to be 75 or 80, what John Peter Baden would have been like. What, what else would he have done uh, in the community? So, uh, I guess we'll never know. He's, he's up there doing some things. <laughs> Is Adelaide Barnard your daughter? 
Adelaide Barnard, was she your daughter? Granddaughter. 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 What about, did you mention about, did you have children? I mean, you have a Yes, he had two. Two. Okay. He had two. What were, those, what were their names? Uh, Martin and Ernst. That's right. I'm sorry. And Martin, Martin and Ernst. Adelaide. And, and when John died. Peter died, uh, if you if you if, if you read the, the portion of of uh, Adelaide's uh, piece, uh, Adelaide really relied on the two boys because they were like 19 and 21, I think, at the time. They really kind of took a hold and and uh, did some help with with the businesses, and eventually uh, Mrs. Baden sold a lot of the businesses to individuals in Winfield. Uh, the, the one banker that was mentioned, Robinson, um, I think was the flour mill that was sold to uh, Mr. Robinson. And, uh, so, yeah, but she... Adelaide went ahead and ran her business because she had such good firm oh, yeah. practices. She had, she had, time. well, she had the two sons and she had very loyal employees. Because of you. It just continued on and eventually uh, there was a line in, in, in the story on Adelaide that she really enjoyed sitting on the, on the porch and watching the birds uh, and that's kind of where she wanted to be. She wanted to kind of back out of, of everything. I can tell you. <clears throat> You know the place on East 9th where John Peter, that he built, uh, has that wrought iron fence around it, you know? The story goes that th there used to be a, a uh, dairy that was more in the downtown area, but the pasture was out east. And so they would drive the cattle from the pasture down what we know as, as ninth down to, to where they would milk the cows. He did not like the cattle traipsing in his front yard. <laughs> and so that hence is the reason that wrought iron fence is around his property at whatever it is at about 11th, or no, it would be... Sherry. Yeah, but it, well, you know where it's at. Okay. You know. And uh, so that's that's another story from from John Peter Bain. Anyway, yes? I have a question about, when you see the roller mill, that one last night, is that what you're talking about? When you're talking about where they did the made uh, flour? Yeah, it was over here kind of where uh, where the elevator is now, yeah. that whole area right over there, yeah. That was the roller mill? That, yep. And how did, did they just grind the... They grain? ground the wheat, the corn, whatever, and, huh. and shipped water, it off. It was a water wheel mill? Yeah. They had a water wheel that connected to the river there? That I can't tell you. Yeah. Back in the 30s, there was Seymour Packing Company that was on West 5th, and they did many of the things that, that John Baden did with, with produce and yeah. panel eggs and all that, and yeah. the railroad cars came in, and, and I worked there when I was a senior in high school, oh. and they, 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 they uh, did the eggs and separated, separated the eggs, and then the, they froze those, and they went on those frozen railroad cars that were sure. beside them, and then that went to the... Cake mix companies, and that's what they used. Mm -hmm. so, my dad worked there. My dad was working there in the 30s. Yeah. Yeah. Roland. I went, so, to, I went to grade school at the building on 7th and Cherry now. Oh, yeah. The brick building Stevenson. for six years. I walked from 12th Street to that building four times a day going to school, and we would go by the Baden property on Church Street. Yeah. And when she, Grandma Baden, would 
open the shutters of the windows on the west side of the house, we would know we could open the gate and go and visit with her on oh. the back porch. Mm -hmm. and we did cool. That many cool. Times yeah. During our school. Yeah. Our school. Didn't one of the sons live in the Pardon? One of the sons, did he not live in the house just east of Yeah, the well, th there were two houses from what I understood. There was one to the east, yes. and there was one catty cornered across the street. If you notice, they're very similar. And I, I, I have been under the impression that he built those for his, uh, his two sons. <laughs> Which one was a scientist? I can't remember. Was it Martin that was a scientist? It was Martin. It was Martin. Adelaide's son was Martin. Martin. Yeah, yeah I think it was Martin. And then, and well, the granddaughter. It was his daughter, too. Yeah, yeah. 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 Named after yeah. yeah. She named it after her daddy. He named it after yeah, named. But he was a remarkable man. He was. I mean, I just, I just marvel. Yes. At the, at the man and what he did. And I don't, you know, it's a good, it's a good thing that we're at 150 years of, of Winfield because it's guys like Albright and guys like Baden that made this community what it is and, all, and allowed us to celebrate the 150th anniversary of, of the community. They made money but they wanted to give back oh, to the absolutely. community. They were just, it was an incredible group of men. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, thank you for, for having me. I hope, you, I hope you've learned something. Yes? Could you say a little bit, please, about circumstances surrounding the closing of St. John's College? <laughs> Well, uh, I was in 